Okay, hi. Hi guys, welcome to the uh, COI workshop session two. Today is Saturday, January 21st. It's 3 p.m. my time, 9 a.m. your time. Um, today we're going to discuss what are the social, cognitive, and teaching presences. But first let's do a quick quality check and make sure that everybody's got their do not disturb sign up, that you shut your door, you've turned off your phone. Relax, take a deep breath, we're ready to begin. On each of your systems, if you could go ahead and give me a green check if you see the red record in the upper right hand corner. Great. And also another one, if you see quality check at the top. Oh, clear. <laughs> there we go. Another one, if you see the quality check at the top. Fantastic. And lastly, if you can hear me well, another green check. Thank you. So let's go ahead and begin with today's learning objectives. And by the end of the session today, we should be able to explain the three presences of the COI framework. Those are the social, cognitive, and teaching presences. And also, we should be able to describe the differences among these. And what we're going to start out with today is a little activity here. Let's go ahead and write our names on the board. Um, you can type it or you can write it. And additionally, if um, you can write beneath that a word that describes yourself today. And I'm going ahead and doing mine as well. And yourself today as a learner or educator within this web session. Okay, I said that mine, I put my name and I said that I'm nervous because this is the first web session I've ever done. Also, um, I've never participated in uh, BB Collaborate as a student either. So um, a little nervous about the whole aspect and familiarizing myself with the system. Bernie says he's busy. I hear you. And then I don't know if Gina's having some issues with hers or not. But we'll go ahead. Technical difficulties. I can get the text box, but I'm um, having problem getting the ability to type or chat. So I'll work on it, but go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, why don't you just share with us then verbally what um, what your word would be for yourself? I would say ambitious. I always uh, bite off more than I can handle. <laughs> OK, well, that's OK. We'll see yours shortly. And I see that Nancy just joined us. Welcome. We were just uh, sharing with each other our, our names and a word to describe ourselves today as a learner or educator and how we're feeling at this moment in the web session. If you can type it, great. If you can't, go ahead and verbally share with us. Sorry, I'm still still new at the tools. I, I agree with you there. <laughs> We're all learning. So I see you're making progress and active. How's the move going? I hope you all can see that. Yes, Nancy and active. Thanks. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on from here. So we're all at different states today, and we're uh, very active and busy and ambitious. I am actually going to be spending this afternoon at Lowe's getting hoses. For You're getting hoses. Uh-oh. It's. It's breaking in and out a little. I don't know if others are hearing that as well. Yeah, I think I got a little bit of a time delay. I apologize. It may be due to my end as well. So, okay. Well, I hope your day goes smoothly. So we'll go ahead and move on with the lesson here and start discussing and exploring our different presences. Um, the first of which that we're going to discuss is social presence. Now this is basically as humans we are all social and learning is social. So 
an overview of this is that this is our the ability of individuals to project that personality in the learning environment and to identify with the group and develop relationships with others within the group. The participants, though, identify first and foremost with the academic purpose of the group, and then the rest kind of develop along the way to the achievement of the goal. Our social presence also incorporates that it's to support it and, and to allow it to flourish, it encourages our probing questions, skepticism, contributions of ideas and explaining those ideas. You know, we have that purposeful goal. We want the and the members of the community will develop relationships in route to achieving those goals. And it's through a collaborative and free process. And lastly our um different support structure to achieve those goals. We have to incorporate effective communication, open communication, and cohesive responses. Now examples of these are effective communication, are like emoticons and using the natural language itself, as well as capitalization, humor, self-disclosure. All of these are examples of expressing that effective communication. Open communication is built through um, the process of how we recognize one another and complement and respond to each other's questions and our, each other's contributions. We want to encourage that reflective participation and discourse. And for example, in the military community, and of which um, my organization is a part of, we have a non-attribution is that basically it's a policy where people can, in a classroom setting, openly share examples and problems from their work setting and discuss it and freely without feeling that it's going to get back to their supervisors or come back on them in some negative way. It's an opportunity for people to share and learn from each other and to help each other work through the problem. Cohesive responses basically mean that we want to address others by name, use the pronouns, the we's, the ours. We're part of a group together. That's the social aspect of it. And of course, as a group cohesion works better together, we're, we, our capacity to collaborate also increases. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and do a little group activity. If you can type in your text chat, go ahead and type an activity that supports social presence in the classroom. And yeah, I just saw the um, comment about what happens to classroom stays in the classroom. Absolutely. Perfect way to word that, that non-attribution. Okay. I am not able to text chat, so um, I would just throw out the icebreaker activity. Uh, okay that kind of gets people started to talk. OK, great. Yeah. And I see Bernie said clickers. And uh, oh, feel free, Nancy, because we're ha having some tough difficulties. So if we can't use the different applications, please feel free to talk and share. Learn one in small groups. Absolutely, all of those things. Yeah, they help build that social presence and that uh, group cohesion and the dynamic of working and collaborating together toward that common goal. Great. OK, we're going to move on now to the second presence, the cognitive presence. Now, when we're defining this, basically, it's what we make, it's the meaning making. You know, it's where all the action is. It's where we're learning, thinking, inquiring. Critical thinking, you know, extends beyond our personal thoughts and experiences. It's, it's really more effective when we do so in a group, that purposeful community of inquiry where we challenge one another. We want those challenges of fellow learners and each other. However, it's also crucial, though, that the group doesn't suppress the curiosity. We want to be supportive, but also we want to have skepticism and to challenge one another so that we can grow. Our critical thinking is that process where we incorporate reflection and the discourse that's you know, driven by reason and by skepticism and curiosity. 
and the interaction of that purposeful open discussion. And we want to make sure to include all of that within that purposeful community and collaboration toward that common goal. Let's also take a look at that model within which we can access our um, cognitive presence and support that aspect of the community of inquiry. And within this, there's four stages or four phases, the trigger, exploration, integration, and resolution. Now, within the slideshow here today and within our presentation, there are dark slides integrated in between with these different phases annotated. Now, that's just a cue as to what aspect of the practical inquiry model that we're working through at that time. And that's the real challenge for all of us educators, is to move our discussion and to move the development of individuals through each of these phases of practical inquiry. And sometimes they don't always happen in sequence, but they happen overlapping or at different times. Sometimes it can be a rather messy process. So we're going to do another activity at this point. And at this, we're going to go ahead and do the polling activity where I'd like you each to respond after I change your polling type here. And it's given a choice of activities. And these different activities examples here uh, support that cognitive presence. You know, which would you prefer as an individual? And let's go ahead and take a look at the responses here. And the majority said A. And uh, obviously, it's pretty clear to assess that today with our small class size, but a discussion forum. And so um, that allows us to have more freedom in, in our speech and sharing of ideas and collaboration. Excellent. And I see that um, creating video responses to prompts. That's also another visual and audio and uh, you know, way of expressing oneself. So it's very interesting to see what personal preferences there are. So now we're going to move on to the third presence, our teaching presence. Now, this is the way in, um, the learning environment was created. This is where a student meaning making and learning takes place, or how it's you know structured. And according to Garrison, um, we, we want to remember that our learning environment should be learning centered and not focused a learner, meaning um, as opposed to a lot of viewpoints where there is a learner-centered approach, we want to be actually focused on the task at hand and the common goal and what are we trying to achieve, what are we trying to learn. So that's an important point we want to make here as well as that the teaching presence is where that educational leader needs to provide you know, needs to provide the purpose, the content, the structure, needs to keep focus going and um, remain flexible, though, because things happen. For example, like in our session here, and we were trying to cue some responses, but the technological issues mean that we have to adapt and we have to go ahead and respond in different ways than planned. And as a teacher, we, we need to uh, provide many roles. We need to be you know, the subject matter expert, the educational designer, the facilitator, we need to organize the activities and guide the discourse and offer additional sources of info and also be able to identify and help to clear up any misconceptions that there may be. We also want to remember that, sorry about that, I jumped ahead here, the teaching process, you know, it's, it's crucial to make sure that the, the learning environment keeps moving forward, that the participation is there, that the quality of responses are there, that you know you have to change it up if something's not working. And it's also largely responsible and drives the other presences, the, both the cognitive and the social presence. Teaching presence is how the teacher establishes his or her identity and structures things. And there's a lot more time on the front end of developing in an online environment to ensure that that structure is in place and that, that scaffolding and the framework is there. 
Now, let's go ahead and take a look at another quick activity. And this one we're just going to talk about. It seems to be the easier route, too, is what does it mean to have teaching presence or to be effectively present in the online environment? Go ahead, Gina. Um, yeah, so I, I think sometimes students get lost in all of the content and activities. And so a, a strong teaching presence really helps students focus and prioritize and, and know, know where they need to really expend their energy. OK, great. Do you guys agree with that, or what do you think about that? Go ahead, Nancy. I agree, especially with the online courses in the aspect of depending upon how technology friendly they are, or once again, as we've learned like with Blackboard and some of the other LMSs that we've looked at, everything's got its little quirks. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, or I'm not sure about any of the rest of you when I first started out with uh, Camtasia. I was clueless. I'd actually never used it before. So it's always very helpful to have an instructor that you can go back and say, but either, A, this is what my issue is, and they can either potentially help you or send you off towards um, the technology people. Or just to have someone, especially with um, online classes, that responds promptly, you know, makes sure that everybody is going along or like, um, when you discover an issue and you're like, hey, everybody, you know, I forgot to tell you, or we've had this problem, this is how you fix it, or because we're having this issue, maybe this is how we can go ahead and modify. But definitely being a presence so the students aren't just kind of uh, wandering in the wilderness. Yeah, that makes sense. What do you, what do you want to add, Bernie? Well, I just think that you know, with technology, it makes it a lot more effective. Um, because we have tools that give us the ability to make announcements ahead of time. Um, we can subscribe to different forums so we know uh, when somebody has posted something, for example, in a help forum that may be lost, you know, email connectivity. Um, we have the ability now for video and audio uh, connectivity that we can actually show them that we're not a robot and we're real people. The, the problem that I see with it is that, I mean, for example, I had a student this week that was just so um, in, you know, awry about how effective another course was being communicative, you know, throughout the course, where I, I live with a computer on my hip, and I know not everybody does that, but, you know, they just want to be able to know, are you listening to me? And that's the biggest problem that I have. Okay. And Nancy? I'm uh, sorry. One other note, too, is you actually still need to make sure that as a teacher that you actually are teaching the information that the students need to learn. I had a statistics teacher, and his big thing was to make sure that you knew how to use your uh, calculator to be able to figure out the, uh, the problem. The issue then became he never actually taught us how to read your word problem and figure out what you need to do before you plug all the formulas into your calculator. So that became an issue of, hey, I want to show you all the technology, but I'm kind of forgetting to show you and actually you know, make sure you understand the actual content to the course. So yeah. No, so I mean, it sounds like what I'm hearing from you all is that you, know, you were saying that you know, the teacher's presence and teaching, actually teaching the skills and the information as well as facilitating the environment and incorporating technology is all key to that teaching presence and being effective in, in the learning environment. Great. So we're going to move on here to, I'm going to share with you a little bit of um, how community of inquiry can be applied at, um, in my career field at uh, Defense Acquisition University. Um, we conduct training for the acquisition world in DOD. And I know that not all of you are um, within the acquisition world. However, um, we do design and develop a lot of online courses um, across a spectrum of different um, fields. And so there's ways that each of these presences can be incorporated or that we have to keep in mind when we're developing 
So for the social aspect, some easy ways to incorporate that and to ensure that we're addressing that is, you know, to go ahead and post introductions and the expectations up front. So when the students join the class, that, that, that's a known. We address the students by name, use expressions of emotions or emoticons when communicating with them, especially one-on-one, -on -one, and post often and that keep that communication open. And to support the cognitive phase, we also want to set high expectations. We want to respond to the students promptly and question them, engage them, analyze ideas, encourage thinking. And lastly, to encourage that teaching presence, we want to provide teacher bios up front so that um, the students will have an idea of your interests, who you are as a person, your expertise, what your background is, adds to your credibility, um, adds to their ability to connect and see that you are the expert in this area. And also uh, that teaching presence needs to be there to show that, that it's well structured and clearly defined rules and responsibilities for everyone, as well as providing frequent feedback to the students. So if, all these, if these things are incorporated into the design of the online courses, it will greatly help to that community of inquiry within the classroom. And our last class activity today is, as I've already said, is though, although many of you are not in the acquisition curriculum, you know, do these same guidelines apply in your field? So if you could give me an emoticon thumbs up or thumbs down, if you agree or disagree if these guidelines apply to your field. Right now it's looking like, yep, you all agree. I was going to ask if, the, if you didn't, if somebody's field had some kind of a difference here that we would go ahead and discuss that. But right now it looks like most of us are in agreement on that one. So let's go ahead and move on to our summary for today. We just had an overview of the three interactive elements of the community of inquiry, you know, our three presences, social, cognitive, and teaching. And at this point, I'm opening it up if there are any questions that you all have. Thank you for that, Gina, letting me know. I appreciate that. Nancy has one. Um, so for the DAU, are most of the courses that you do online, or is there kind of like a, a mix of, of uh, you know, online blended face-to-face uh, -face maybe? Um, we actually kind of cover the whole spectrum. We have a lot of traditional classes where it's all face-to-face. And then we have quite a few online courses for the basic information and background things that people across DOD actually use. For example, government purchase card courses. Some of our courses are required for that. Additionally, we do have a blending, although it's not quite as interactive as what we've experienced, that the blending is more of, you know, the pre-course work is assigned and being, there's communication going on ahead of time before the class begins. And then it's a way of communicating during the class as well or to get additional help. So, yeah. so we covered a little bit of variety. And I'm hoping that you know down the road to integrate more of this interactivity in some of our online courses. We will see. If you guys think of any additional questions, please feel free to email me. And at this point, go ahead, relax, take a deep breath, turn your phone back on, and remember, True inspiration comes from words written over blurry images. So you all have a good day and take care.